It's not 15,000. Oh, God. Because if this guy had written Bartok's underneath Stroll's helicopter, uh, all the mates in the workshop would have chucked in another five grand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's 20 grand. And I <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Collecting Addicts podcast. That remains the name, but is up for debate and could change at any time. I'm joined again by my cohorts, Neil Clifford, Edward Lovett, Chris Cooper and Manish Pandey. First of all, as you can see visually, we are currently wedded to a particular cigarette brand, but other cigarettes are available. Let's start today with what is one of the great issues of our time. I'm talking about wheel design. We've gone through alloy wheels. We'll come back to that. We're now talking about great car seats i've thought about this for so much of my life uh the aesthetic of the seat the feel of the seat manish start us off with a visual prop a la clifford i don't know if you can see this oh yeah. yes yes periscopio Ooh. 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 so hollywood 1992 i have just finished my elective at UCLA. Every day I take the bus from Westwood to UCLA to go and work in their medical center. This is absolutely true. One morning I'm going up, I'm with the endocrinology team. They say, meet you, meet me in ITU. And I go to the intensive care unit, the lift goes up and it was like a space, space age hospital, this. Um, and the doors open and I hear a banjo playing. And I mean, a, I don't mean a band, I mean a banjo, like someone can play the banjo. I walk in and it's George Siegel and he's in the middle of ITU and he's just playing and entertaining all the nurses and the doctors because his wife was in ITU. Now, I think I'm not allowed to tell you what was wrong with her, but um, it blew my mind. That was my very last day at elective. And I thought, could this day get any better? And as I was going towards the bus, I went past this place called Lotus Lamborghini. I used to pass it every single day. And in the window, the salesman in a green polo shirt kind of looked at me and I'd, I'd seen him every day for six weeks. And he went like that. And I went in, he was English and he was a massive Nigel Mansell fan. And this is Mansell's year, 1992. Yeah. We ended up talking and he said, so what's your favorite car in the world? Because I see you looking in this window every day. And I said, it's a Lamborghini Countach. And he said, we have an LP400 Periscopo downstairs. Lovely. Come with me. And I go downstairs and I just sit in this car. And it's the car of my dreams. And he said, start the engine. Go on. And mm -hmm. I turn the key and it goes ding, ding, ding. And then that hum, which turns out to be the carburetors. And then it's the <laughs> And started, and I just sank into this seat. That was a and brand new car, was it? No, no, someone was having their car. <laughs> Not that long ago. So no, he said it was 1972. Oh, no, 1972. 1992. How old do you think Mansell is? Wait, wait, no, 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 sorry, sorry about that. What, Talk what, about, um, he's just got to the point of the story where we get to really bleed our hearts. And you chime in with that. You're an emotional bulldozer, love it. Right, manage, forget it. <laughs> Someone moot, love it. So I literally, I literally sank into this and I just listened to this car and he had to take a photo. I sank into the car, he took a photo and I just couldn't move. I turned the engine off, I sat there for 20 minutes and that is the best car seat I have ever sat in in my entire life. I must have been in a thousand cars nothing felt like that and nothing will feel like that again right who fancies following that we got where, where was that showroom that was lotus lamborghini in hollywood Obs. Oh. by it's, the way you can't bid for that car it's probably been sold already no no i was thinking i was wondering if it was um someone i know but, um, who was the guy we had dinner with when we were out in la in january paul osborne oh. Yes, okay, yeah. could be. Uh, Neil Clifford, car seats. Right, I've got one word. It, yeah. can't, it can't be beaten. Yeah. Recaro. Yeah. yeah. So when yeah, I... In fact, Recaro, as, as most of us know, was two words. It was uh, Reuter Corusier or whatever. It yeah. was the manufacturer of all Porsche. The yeah. Adidas of seats. They made, yeah, they made the 356. And of course, when it came with the 911, they then did a lovely German deal 
and said, actually, you can't make our cars anymore, but here you are forevermore, you're going to make our seats. So every Recaro seat, and there's many, and we'll, 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 um, hopefully there'll be some more Recaro seats. To me, the Recaro seat of the 996 GT3 Mark I, <clears throat> I was a massive fan of the RS model. I was confused when this GT3 thing came along. What is this GT3? But then you saw it. You saw the Zanzibar red launch color. You saw the wheels. Uh, you saw the body kit. You saw that incredible stance of the thing, all that titanium stuff in the press release. But to me, it was about that bloody seat that looks like an elephant's ear. It's an incredible seat. I've owned two or three of those cars, both club sport in, in uh, Nomex and in the black leather in the standard car. It's, it's, a, it's the best car seat ever made, basically. Yeah, hard to beat the car, right? Yeah, it's hard to beat it. It's very strange looking. If you move on from the 993 RS and look at those Recaros, there was this massive jump forward in design, but I think that seat maketh the car. Okay. I, I can't disagree. I mean, I, I'm not sure about the greatness of the Gen 1 GT3. We can have a punch up over that. But seat, You're a Mark II fan. I know that. The, I seat, know. the seat the seat, is amazing. And actually, the seat is better than the shell they had for the Carrera GT seat, as they call it, and currently the 918 seat. Agreed. It, yeah. It, 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 it supports better. you. In the, a seat should get you under the breasts. It shouldn't, yeah. it shouldn't impede your shoulders. And no one needs massive thigh bolsters. It's not the way it works. Uh, Chris Cooper, you. So um, we'd all choose Recaro. I think because those 90s fast forwards with the tennis racket in the 70s, RS200, the Ooh. professionals, Doyle had the RS200, wonderful. But the first time I realized seats were a thing, because I grew up with Fords and Vauxhalls and stuff in the family. And a mate of my father's turned up in 1982, E21 323, that had Alpina bits. And there were two things. One, the seat was that wonderful Alpina sports seat. And I sat in it and realised that seats didn't have to be squidgy. It, it felt so hard. Those German seats of, we forget now, they were so hard. And it was the seat and wheel combo. It had that, that X-wing cross four-spoke BMW Alpina sports dream. Yeah. I just thought, this is a different species of thing. So that early 80s Alpina sports seat, the really firm one, thinking, you must be joking. He took me out and drive around Kent in it. Well, this is the loveliest thing. It made seats a thing. So if we can't have Recaro, because Neil's got it, I'd have early 80s Alpina with that sort of X-wing, four-spoke Alpina steering wheel. Oh. Mm. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm going to chime in with one Recaro observation that I'm sure you'll all understand and many of our listeners will understand, and that is that do you get childishly excited when you're flying steerage on a plane and you see Recaro written on the seat in front of yes. you? Yes. They make so many, whenever I see an airline seat that's made by Recaro, I think I'm in a superior seat here. This is going to be a better seating experience because I trust yeah. them with my with any of my seating arrangements. Right, I've got some written down here. Um, I'm a big fan of a road going seat. I think it's quite easy to make a big aggressive bucket seat that's a quasi racing yeah. seat with a load of support, but to make a seat that looks good, that is ostensibly a road car seat that might fold forwards and, and give you more practicality is a bit more difficult. And I think there's two that stand out for me. One is the generic Porsche sports seat from the late 80s, the G-Series Carrera, and also in the 928, but the one with yeah. the big bolsters. The bolsters, they were, so, yeah. they were so big, they almost come out ahead of your chest line, the point where you almost feel that like you could rest your elbows on them. And it's, it's like having a constant hug when you're driving the car and there's so much support in the seat but your legs are free to move around it's just it's another one of those products that's so clearly been designed and defined by someone who really yeah. gets it and the other one that must never go uh, un unmentioned is just the good old-fashioned volvo seat from the 80s and 90s it's not sporty it's not clever no, but they just made the best seats you could sit in one of these things for 10 hours and your coccyx was fresh as a daisy uh, and the heating was nuclear as well um edward follow that lot what was the was it the bmw m5 uh the up post e39 that when e60. you when yeah. you e60 Active seat when you turned around the corner it it mm. <laughs> moved you around Active seat bolsters. yeah <laughs> i have one of those yeah. well I've, I've got two seats 
And for me, it's not really about the seat. It's more, it's about where I'm sat in the actual car and where's the gear shift, Ooh, yeah. the steering wheel. In a road <laughs> car, can I move my arms around enough when I lose control on a roundabout by mistake in <laughs> slippery conditions? So, and, and, and in that, how it inspires me to drive that particular car. If, and I know the moment I'm sat in a car, uh, can I drive this car quickly? Before it's even started, I, I have that feeling. And my singer was the car that I got into. And, and a lot of 911s, you, it just fits like a glove. And for me, that seating position, steering, gear shift, a, yeah. enough uh, ability to move my arms around. And I need a lot of room to move my arms around when I get it wrong. Um, most of the time, it actually doesn't matter because I probably get it wrong anyway. Um, and then the other seat, which is more of a, a phenomenon to me, is how is it that a 1988 Porsche Club Sport with its pinstripe, probably Recaro seats? 968? No, 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 uh, uh, no an, 88, oh. an 88 3.2 Club 3 Sport. 3.2 Club Sport, right. How is it, whether it's done 1,000 miles or 300,000 miles, the seat looks exactly the same. It's yeah. never shown anywhere. That, to me, that, that's the sign of a good seat. That's class. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. That cloth is bulletproof. It is. I love it. Awesome. But that seat, <laughs> that position thing, um, Renault, I looked at a, I nearly got a Renault Clear, one of those 182 things about 20 years ago. But the seat, it's up here somewhere. And yeah, it's even in the trophy, it's a bit too high. It's too high, and the steering was... Uh, the, ya the Yaris GR for me is that. The moment I, I sit in it, yeah. I just can't get the seat low yeah. enough. And, and I, I, read that and thought, I don't feel comfortable car. driving it that quickly. Yeah. So yeah. many cars have the same problem. Mark 1 Focus RS, how they yeah. get that wrong, I do not know. We do start to sound quite adenoidal at that point. Right, now, uh, <laughs> moving on to our F1 chat for this week. No one's really tested anything yet. They've been out and driven their cars, but we don't know too much. So let's not speculate what's going on there. We know some are black and we know that the engine cover of the Merc is a bit funky. Everyone's speculating whether that Ferrari front wing is just a diversionary tactic. All of the above. We'll come to that when we when we need to. Let's discuss this, um, this Brad Pitt F1 film because Lewis was quoted as saying he's about to select who or help cast who the person is going to be that Brad Pitt mentors. Uh, I think the storyline being that, or the script being that Brad Pitt is an F1 elder who comes in and mentors a young boxer. It's like the Rocky Five with Formula One. Um, I don't know about you guys. I don't have great hopes for this film. Am I being unfair? Man, no. if... <laughs> oh, God, that's straight up. Um, yes, I <laughs> think that fictionalising Formula One is very, 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 very tricky. Fictionalising motor racing, full stop is very tricky and I I've never seen a truly successful Formula One film and it might be because you know know too much about it maybe because um no you know what it is they get lazy with the characters and they get soapy with the plot and that is the bottom line and every single film I have ever seen certain motor racing is lazy with characters and soapy with plot and I just can't see this one being any different and I know it's kind of from the team that gave us Top Gun, but actually, although it was a very emotional movie for me, it was it was an emotional movie for me because it made me feel 18 years old. And it reminded me that I was 18 years old once and it did it in a closed room and it did it with great special effects and it did it with great this and that. But I think a motor racing movie with the characters that they have, ugh, yeah. uh, Brad Pitt, what is he, 93 now, 79, something <laughs> like that. He's, he's, gonna good, play, what, a, he's gorgeous. He's gonna he's gonna play Mansell aged motor race, and you can sort of see it, can't you? I could have been a champion, and you know, if it wasn't for the front wing failure in the last race, and <laughs> Michael Massey doing that, you know, it was me, and you know, this is my chance to do it, but I'm not gonna do it because uh <laughs> because I'm looking out for the young kid here that Lewis has uh, picked for me, and uh, and they do this with their hands a lot, by the way. Over their mouths because Al Pacino taught them to do that in '73. Is that a thing? Like, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's it, a thing. You're doing, but I, I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I don't okay. just touch your face a lot. And We're going to watch you right doing out. that now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's because that scene in, I mean, Top Guns are good enough because it's the same team, isn't it? It's uh, Kosinski, uh, you know, all the same people. And 
the test is, I, I really like Top Gun Maverick and I've watched it about 25 times because I, I, I really love it. It's such a great film and I cry because I realize I'm actually not too old to be a Top Gun pilot. Conversation another time. But that scene in that scene in Maverick where Maverick <laughs> steals the plane and aces the simulated attack run and he sets a two minute 15 time and he beats it by 0.16 per second. You can tell I've watched this a lot of times. You can imagine that scene in the F1 film. And you know, at the end of it, they say, Whoa, James, whoa, you think, well, yeah, we see that every week. It's called qualifying. And yeah, it could be even less than 0.16 per second. They think. It's going to be shit. I'm really sorry. You know right. what he's going to do though? You're going to, the audience is going to know he's going to break that <coughs> time and then he's going to lift just before he breaks that time because he can't get the pole position because he's in second place behind the rookie. Who's anyway, going who's going to get the role? Is it going to be James Corden? Is that why he's leaving Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> also, the problem we're going to have is quite often, maybe this will signify the Americanization of Formula One. Will it be pole position or will he be on the pole? Oh dear, don't even will, start be, will, that. will he drive into the pits or will he drive down pit road? Pit road. This, this is this is the thing. Do, do, are, is this the initial Americanization of Formula One? Actually, I'm not so xenophobic that I give a monkeys about that at all. Race car drivers. I agree with Manish. It's it, it, a sport should unto itself be the entertainment, and I don't really see why you need to fictionalize the 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 action is it formula one is fantastic when it when it's entertaining and, and the idea of making a, a separate parallel world of formula one into a film i, I don't really get it it's all a bit fraught but oh, maybe, i think that's the truth i think that's the reality the the reality is better than any fiction you could even think about yeah. creating well when, I'll give you but, I, but I answer me answer me one thing neil and that is if if I'm an F1 aficionado that can't really handle a fictionalised film about Formula One, does that mean that all boxing fans shouldn't be able to watch Rocky? But but they can they find is it because they find Rocky funny? I don't know. Well, I, uh, you know the reason why Top Gear is good is because of um, what's his name? What's what's his what's the Tom book? Cruise? Tom Cruise, and I suppose Rocky's yeah. Rocky's good because of the the one actor, whatever his name was. You know, I, I don't like those bloody movies. I, I would, I'd be controversial here and say, I enjoyed Ford versus Ferrari. I did. I did. I, I cried. I know you didn't manage, but I did. And I, and I, I know it wasn't, you know, they got all the facts wrong and the characters wrong. And, but I, I thought it was a great uh, human story. And I did cry at the end. And I yeah. thought, but you, did you, you watch it on the plane, Neil? I watched it on the plane. I've watched it at home. I've watched yeah. it on my laptop. I've watched it five or six times. And I, you know, I think, you know, I'm a big Le Mans guy. I've been since '89. I suppose I'm connected to it in that way. But I thought it emotionally, it, it works for me. There, there was. Have you anyone seen Manish? Do you know, that it's a film that Patrick Dempsey was involved in. Racing in the rain. Racing in the rain. I watched it just before. I was on a plane coming back just before COVID. And I mean, I won't spoil the ending. The ending is just crucifyingly, hand bitingly embarrassing. But there's something about it I quite liked. It was no, no, I agree. Listen, I think that with all of these things, and the more modern they are, the kind of mise en scene, the set design, all of that, it's all really beautiful. You can sometimes get these moments of exquisite atmosphere. But I suppose the the warning signs I had were that you know, if Lewis is quoted correctly, he was saying things like. This is how Formula One will be in the future and should be now, you know, and you got this sense that, you know, they were going to press, you know, I will remind the audience that um, Chris Harris and I are brown people, but uh, they were they were pointing out, you know, the fact that it's going to be sort of more ethnically diverse, you know, women are going to have different roles in this, and unless they do set this in 2050, it, I'm going to find it quite terrifying to see, you know, kind of five massive female mechanics putting tires on cars, because that's how Hollywood casts them. You know, I, I think that these things are. Um, so the, it's about, end, it's, about the the best... it, it, it's quite strongly weighted towards the cast and it having some sort of genuine feel. Yeah, I, I guess so. And, and you know, this, just forget about just sort of motor racing movies. But what's the best mentor movie you've ever seen? I mean, what is the best movie you've seen where someone older really hands the baton down to someone younger, even if there's a little conceit that the older person could still be doing the job? And I think it's quite hard 
to tell a story like that without making it patronizing. That's my kind of, so even at a character level, maybe that wouldn't, wouldn't be the way I'd do it. But I you think know, the tricky this thing guy who played know. Elvis, he, he would be the best guy. Mm. Yeah. I, I would love to see him. Yeah. But, you know, the motor racing driver, that would just be great. You know, someone yeah, before, like that. Before we, before we sign off from, from the, giving a, a zero star review of a film that's yet to be made, <laughs> um, can we, um, I asked the question on our little WhatsApp group, has there ever been a great motorsport film? And my answer is no. I, I'm going to cause outrage probably, but the James Garner Grand Prix film is, is about as good as it gets for me for the action scene. Yeah, it's still watchable. I love, I love the foot cam. I love the sense the cars are being driven by proper people. Le Mans is a snooze fest for me. I've got lots of posters of it dotted around bedrooms and stuff. But I, I don't yeah, think that's terrible. I love Steve McQueen. I love the 9-11 at the beginning. I love the, I love the story behind the film more than the film. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's a great... There isn't a great fictional motorsport film because the, well, but but that's that's taking the piss, isn't it? That's different. I mean, that's, yeah. about, about Rush is that is that swearing we're managed on here? I mean, what what? I mean, I enjoyed it, but I, I suppose even if it's a shit motorsport film, I'm going to enjoy it more than other films. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's sure. the point. Sure. And I suppose we feel underserved because in our geek world, we think, well, there's not much content for us. Which is a lie because there's there's now days of footage of all of our favorite racing on. I mean, all on... Brad Pitt really needs to do is talk about you know kind of his favorite wheel design for two minutes in it, and let's yeah. face it, it would be the greatest motor racing movie ever. <laughs> Manish, can you knock us out some sort of comedy uh, motor racing movie, a bit sort of the Caddyshack version of uh, uh, of motor? I'll have the log line ready. For I think we need to fit love it with a, we need to fit love it with a mute button. He's proved yeah. that times today already. We didn't miss him last week, did we? Now, our imaginary two-car garage. Uh, this week, I'm not going to tell you who this was written by. <coughs> An ex-F1 mechanic who's just lost his job at Aston Martin Formula One because he wrote buttocks in gaffer tape on the underside of Lawrence Stroll's helicopter. He was duly fired, but he got a £15,000 payout. Um, he needs to buy with this two cars. Well, he should buy two cars. One is a daily and one's to have fun. Um, mechanical complexity isn't the problem with the, for this guy because he um, he doesn't need to worry about that. He can fix stuff. He's a master spanner. Right. Edward Lovett, you go first. OK, well, first of all, you were all wrong last week, by the way, and uh, with the Manchester-based tech entrepreneur because he actually bought a 997 GT2 and a Lotus 211, and he bought them off collectingcars.com. Um, but anyway, it was a very yeah, good effort nice. from all of you. Congratulations. <laughs> so this didn't take me very long to spend my £15,000. And the first car, which is my daily, because I've was i sort of been a fan of Aston Martin for a long time. Yes, the F1 team has been through a few iterations, but I've always liked the, the brand and the manufacturer. And I, I found it quite strange when they bought a load of Toyota IQs and then turned them into oh, the Signet. And I thought they did a terrible job. And as an engineer, I've decided I'm going to buy a Toyota IQ and I'm going to reimagine the Aston Martin Signet. And I'm going to call it the Stroll because it's very yes. slow. So I'm going to create the Aston Martin Stroll, which does about 23 miles an hour. It's good, it's good on the fuel. I don't have a lot of money. With all the bits you nicked out the workshop before you got Yeah, yeah, all of that. It's going to have a wing. It's going to, it's going to sort of look like a Renault F1 Twizzy, something. It'll be a proper dog's dinner, but it's going to be dynamically. It's going to be very good. And then as my fun car, I have bought, which is a bit sacrilege because it's front wheel drive, but I think it, it, my, my fellow community like these, I bought a Honda Integra Type R oh, nice. in white with the lovely red seats, mm -hmm. nice gear shift. Mm -hmm. that, that's my 15,000 pounds, very well spent. Proper, proper. Neil Clifford, what are you going to do with your £15,000 hard-earned well, redundancy money? Well, I'm, I, I've gone one sporty Sunday morning drive and one classic for turning up at sort of Vista Scramble. So I've gone Renault Clio 182, five grand, seven grand, you know, oh. hopefully the Frenchy blue one. Um, it's not a trophy, but it's almost there, you know, very highly respected car. Super good fun. 
And then I would go, you have to, if you're going classic, sort of, you have to go Mercedes. And I think a sort of 83 Y Reg 230 coupe, hard top. So the coupe, not the convertible, although actually the convertible was only Tickford or something, wasn't it? It was a, it was a um, conversion. The two door, 230, I don't mind the four cylinders because it's all about just cruising along. Manual, sunroof, windy, yeah. manual windows, uh, original stereo, hopefully buy it off an old guy that's had it from new. Lovely classic for my Sunday Bista scramble thing and then a little 182 Renault for um, going around corners and track days. What colour is this W123? Please, please tell me it's that sort of cat mustard. Beige. Yeah, mustard. mustard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would go more mustard than hearing a beige. Yeah. But I would, yeah, I would, I would, be, yeah, I would, I would be, yeah, mustard. Metallic, with metallic sick. Yeah. Uh, Max, what's your two car garage going to be? Oh gosh, um, I must have been listening to uh, Mr. Clifford. Um, the the reason I got into Formula One was because I was a massive Senna and Lotus fan when I was a kid. So with my fifteen thousand pounds and my master spanner skill, I'm going to find myself a 1977 Lotus Eclat. Oh, that's and so I cool. found one in black and it was £11,000 and it has the, you, you know, they made the two engines, the original 1973 and the 2.2. I'd go for the original engine, the 907. The Renault engine. Yeah, it's, it's just great. It doesn't really break. I think the car weighs just about a ton. And I think that because I can do all kinds of things like rip the back seats out and do all kinds of whatever, I think it's can't touch the seats. Better. They're the coolest rear seats you've got. Yeah. Leave. No, you're right. Actually, you know, you're, you're you're right. The dog as well. The dog yeah. as well. Right? So that is that would be my Sunday morning car. And actually, my I only had about four thousand pounds left, and I did find one. I couldn't find a one eight two for this kind of money, but I could find a one nine seven Clio for oh, the newer one. Month. Yeah. yeah, slightly more horsepower, but it is slightly heavier, but it is a bit more revvy. And I think because I'm a mechanic and it's got 16 for that, just they would be my two cars. Mm. My two cars. You've, also, you've also there inadvertently dragged this into a pronunciation black hole. Is it a cla? Could you say that with a straight face or do you say a clat? A clat. It has to be I two. Think you're, you're probably asked, but it's like, how do you say moe and chandon? Do you say moe? Well, if, if you, if you, if you, if you do, you've it's, bought the wrong product, so let's not go there. It's all <laughs> context. It's context. So, in the 80s, it would have been a class. Okay. A class. I think, um, I'm going to move us on to Chris Cooper for his £15,000 pairing. Well, it's not 15000 Oh, God. Because if this guy had written buttocks underneath Stroll's helicopter... Uh, all the mates in the workshop would have chucked in another five grand. <laughs> so it's, it's 20 grand. And I have to say, I don't know, what, Edward, where you and Neil have been shopping, but I, I can't see how you spent anything less than 30 grand. Last year. Anyway, so I've got 20 grand, okay, because the boys... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there's two. So he he lives at Silverstone because he's been there forever. Actually, I know this guy. It's called Matthew. He lives in our village, and I've known him for years and years. And he's he's solid gold. And I reckon knowing Matthew, he'd have, his everyday driver would be early 2000s Land Cruiser V8 diesel, 217,000 odd miles. I reckon he could get a really good one for about eight and a half grand. And his fun car would be a VXR8 with a V8 motor. Um, 2007, about 12 and a half grand. So- Bogan, Bogan Mobile. Brilliant. He, Matthew would be well chuffed with that, and he'd thank the blue, the lads as well for the extra five grand. Okay, um, there's some for some crackers in there. I can't, I can't just go into this. My, mine's slightly different. So fifteen thousand um, pounds. Our man's had a bit of a Jaguar obsession most of his life. He's a bit of a Browns Lane boy because his father had one, and it it takes him back. But his father always had six cylinder. Jags, and he always wanted two fuel filler caps, like we all did. Nice. The fascination of two fuel gauges, which made you suddenly think you were in a quasi aircraft, and maybe you could tap one of them like that to make sure it was working. Um, so he wanted a Daimler Double Six, and he wanted that crazy one they made in the XJ40 shape. So it's got all the electronics. That yes, on. the six liter. Yeah, he wants the big oh, fella, yes. he wants, he, and he, he's gonna. He's bought a fleet of multimeters because he's gonna be chasing wires around this thing. Um, that's not cost him an awful lot of money, but he reckoned he reckoned of the ten grand budget, he's going to spend five grand buying the best one he possibly can. But it needs five thousand pound fuel and generally things going wrong contingency. Um, 
Then he thought he's going to buy a nice modern car to go with it or something modern and reliable. But like all of us, he's on collecting cars late one night. He's poured himself a really generous scoop of Lagavulin. He's there sitting there. It's one in the morning and a 205 XS Peugeot comes up. 1988 with the facelifted dash, stub axles fixed, new dampers. She's a beauty. One careful lady owner from the Swindon area. And he thinks, I've got to have this. I've got to have this. And his finger gets a little bit ragged and he buys it. Uh, but, he get, but he gets it for five grand, which is an absolute bargain. So he's got that and a David double six. And uh, in his oh. month sorting this out, he's no way of actually reliably getting to work, wherever that work might be now. But he knows he's safe from the Aston Martin Empire. OK, Lucky now... Him. Uh, moving on. Now, this is this is this next suggestion is loaded very much towards uh, one of my learned colleagues, uh, because we're going to just come up with a Senna memory. You can't have the bloke that basically made Senna and not have a bit of a Senna chat. We've managed to avoid it for five weeks. But on this sixth outing, let's start with a Senna memory. And Manish, I hope you won't be angry if I don't let you go first. because I suggest yours might go on a bit longer. Chris Cooper, tell me. Tell me what your Senna memory is. Okay, so uh, about 32, 33 years ago, my then flatmate, now my wife, Lynn, she had a girlfriend who she didn't see very often. And it would have been summer 1990. And I worked out that her girlfriend had a boyfriend who was a racing driver. I won't say her name. Um, but I worked this out because on the bathroom floor in our flat, there was a book and the face and name of her boyfriend was on the front of this book. And on the inside cover was written the girlfriend name in a few words. And it was signed off, I will love you always, Ayrton. Cool. And I was sat on the loo reading this thinking, is there another Ayrton somewhere who just thinks this is a funny joke? I'm not saying to Lynn, and she said, yeah. Later that year, October 1990, the girlfriend, we hadn't seen, we saw her twice in the year. We'd been somewhere on Fulham Road all night, something, got back. It was seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And we just watched that Japanese Grand Prix. And the girlfriend was with us just by chance. And 7.30, 8 o'clock is whatever it was. The telephone, it was a landline, in our flat. I'm seriously, I'm not making this up. Telephone in our flat rang. And my now wife's girlfriend leapt up across our quite small thing. This is our flat. Where's she going? And she went and grabbed the phone. And she was talking for about five minutes. And she came back and said, oh, he's so pissed off. He's so pissed off. That Alan Prost. And we sat there watching what had happened. I was thinking, Ayrton Senna's just called our flat. Fuck. Ayrton Senna's just called... So I've always seen him differently, and even now, I still can't believe he's gone. So that's my memory. I think, I think, I think we'll leave this one to Chris and Manish. I haven't got much to come back from that. No. Jesus Christ. Manish, no. can, you give us, can you give us one? Can you, give, you must have a thousand, but give us one. Okay, I'll try not to cry during this. This is a tough one. When I um, when we had when we went to Sao Paulo to interview Viviane for the film, um, it was two thousand and nine, um, and Bianca Senna's niece said, "Would you like to see his office? We've kept it exactly as it was after he died." So I mean, I wasn't going to say no. So we go into his office, and it's a beautiful office, big thing massive desk and he was very sort of ainly retentive about business cards kept them all in alphabetical order and they were all in these little drawers behind his desk and she said do you want to sit on his chair and I said no I don't want to sit on his chair but I stood behind his desk and I looked and it's the command position in this room big windows to the right wall to the left and then I noticed that the door we'd come through was actually a double door not a single door and so I said, why does he have a double door there? And she said, and I've got a not well up now. She said, <clears throat> he was just planning his retirement and what he would do. And because he loved his dad so much, his dad had the mirror room across the hallway. And the idea was when neither of them had meetings, they'd open both their double doors and they could see each other. Oh. 
Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's, that's pretty special. Um, wow. Neil Clifford, go on. Give us a set of memory. Oh, talk about being uh, underwhelming with my story now. Um, I was traveling around Australia in a Volkswagen camper van in 1994 and was living actually at the time. I remember the day, the day when it happened. I was living in St Kilda in a, in a um, well in a camp camper van, but actually we were in a hostel with my now wife, and we were I was running a computer shop and she was working in a, um, a Marilyn Monroe lookalikes restaurant. So she would work all night and I would work all day and we wouldn't see each other. And the day the day it happened, I was in the Commonwealth Bank of Australia in St Kilda, and we were just planning the night before our trip to Adelaide. Because we we were convinced that a we would see Senna, and b that we would see Damon Hill win the world championship, and over the radio they were playing the news in this bank, and they reported um, the the event of Senna's passing, and the whole of the bank, the employees, the customers went totally silent, and we all looked at each other and thought fuck that is like a hideous thing yeah and we, we got home and you know like we're on our way to Adelaide I think Adelaide was the last race or the second last race whenever it was and we watched that event of, of Schumacher the little shit basically um do his deed on 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 hill but I will always remember just stood in that bank in a queue listening to the radio thinking oh my god that's um that's just awful. I think for many of us, Senna's passing was was a sort of moon landing moment, wasn't it? We're it all was. In the, was. Where we were. Um, my, mine's more upbeat. I had no contact with Ayrton Senna. The closest I ever got to Ayrton Senna was probably Andrew Frankel's wonderful beaten up silver briefcase, which came from the NSX launch on which he got a lap with Ayrton Senna. I always loved that. Andrew's very, very fond of that briefcase for, for good reason. Um, I think... Uh, I now look, know a lot more about Ensenna than I did when I was his biggest fan when I was younger because there wasn't much about him. You used to read stuff, but there weren't multiple documentaries. He was quite a private man. And you might, I was too young, really, probably to be a regular reader of water sport. Mm. Uh, and so what you did is you you had to wait for great journalism to come about about Ensenna. You, you guys will all know where I'm going with this. It's a story written by Russell Bulgin um, called Welsh Rabbit, which yeah. when he went out. And Ensenna basically bunked off when he was a, a factory Lotus driver, bunked off to Wales to go and drive a load of rally cars for a laugh. Um, and the way Russell writes the story, if you can find a copy of it or go onto the Car Magazine website, which by the way, is a resource of amazing stories from, from, from Cars Golden Era. Um, uh, but the, if you can read Welsh Rare Bit by Russell Bulgin, it'll give yeah. you an idea of the fact that this was, he was the real deal. And he turned up wearing, there's these pictures of him wearing his, his JPS overalls, skidding an escort Cosworth round, I don't know where he's, Walters Arena or somewhere like, or, or Sweet Lamb, somewhere like that, a test venue. But that that's when I, I think when I read that, I just, I was so glad it was a confirmation that he was the hero that I yeah. thought he was. And that he had this overarching love for cars. And shortly after that, I saw a picture of him with a Tamiya radio control car and thought, okay, I'm, I'm now sold. Um, Edward, um, what do you remember from Ayrton Senna? Well, probably none of the stories are as, as romantic, but, but, I, but for me, I, I've grown up and I like sport, but I've never, I've never followed a team, football, rugby, anything. I've never really followed any individual needing them to win apart from Ayrton Senna. He's the only sportsman. And, and, you know, we, as a family, used to go to the Grand Prix every year at Silverstone. And, you know, that I just wanted to see Ayrton Senna. That, that, that was it. And, we, and there's no deep context behind it. And, and it's probably the magic that comes with Ayrton. And, uh, and I remember the first time I, I, I went and started go-karting as a young child and I con convinced someone in my family business to paint my racing helmet i did it in uh senna colors yeah yeah well um, love it love it well, i've i've been absolutely unsure about you for the last five weeks i really really like you now <laughs> <laughs> don't hold on to it for long 
<laughs> okay, so, uh, so this 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 doesn't segue perfectly with social media, but I was driving a Ruby Stone Porsche 992 GT3 a few hours ago at Brands Hatch back in Bristol now because of the magic of the motor car, um, and it's a it's a special car with a kit fitted to it by Mantai. Mantai, for those of you that don't know, is now a wholly Porsche owned Skunk Works division that was a private race team. That they're the gods of the Nurburgring, and Olaf Mantai is the man that, that that made Porsche synonymous with, with the Nordschleife and that 24-hour race. So they've done a tuning kit. It's a suspension package with some aero parts that go on to a 992 GT3. Ostensibly, it closes the gap between a GT3 and a GT3 RS. I want my colleagues here to guess how much the, this kit costs. Okay, loaded question. And also, how much faster it is around the Nordschleife. Okay, let's start off with Chris Cooper. I'm going to write all of your things down here. CC. I, I think the price is slightly easier to guess from the time. I reckon it's 65,000 euros. Yeah. And I reckon it might be two seconds, absolute outside. Okay. Ooh. That's expensive. That Per second, that's a lot of cash. Neil Clifford. Oh, I, I can't do euros. Uh, 50,000 pounds. Yeah. And... 14 seconds. Oh, bloody hell. They get a turbocharger for that. Right, uh, Manish. <laughs> I'm going to go for £35,000, and I think it takes five seconds off the lap. Okay, uh, and Edward Lovett. I know how much it costs because you told me earlier on. So just to try and make you, just to try and make you feel your story better, uh, what is it? Five grand, something like that. <laughs> can't, can't be any more than five grand, Chris. And, uh, you didn't tell me the time, but I'm thinking three and a half seconds. Okay, so the Manti Performance Kit for the two <laughs> GT3 costs. Fifty thousand five hundred ninety-three pounds, and for that you don't get any more power and torque. You get springs, dampers, some aero parts, and some nice badges. Seems quite expensive to me. You also get a really nice set of wheels, or I thought you did. The wheels, the man, the lightweight Manto wheels, are another nine thousand one hundred sixty-five pounds. Okay, so we're up to sixty thousand already pounds, and that's before fitting, which I'm led to believe is probably not unadjacent to ten thousand pounds. So. This is a 70 grand kit. So even, even at the outer limit, Chris Cooper, 65,000 euros, yeah, even if the euro was a parity. Um, and the time, the time it gains you on the Nordschleifer is 4.19 seconds. Okay, a bit more. What did you, so, what did you say, Manish? Four five seconds. seconds. Oh. Five seconds. So, so Manish yeah, was You didn't pay enough for it. You won't get four seconds, Manish. You only paid for half of it. Manish was close That's to the true. time. Chris Cooper, no surprise. I, it was, I, you'll see a video coming up on Collecting Cars soon about the wow. car. I, I have to say, I, I expected to be really quite unimpressed. But, but I, oh, there's the woofer. Excuse me. Zuko. <laughs> Zuko. Um, but but I was, I, it brought out some old some old 911 feelings for me. It, 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 it was the same colour as a 94 RS. And the way it drove reminded me of that as well. But that was, that was some good guesses there. But I mean, is the has the world gone mad? Should we should we really think that's a sensible set of prices? And, and that's and who's driving that? That's presumably like a Lars Kern or something like that. I presume that is, yeah. You you know, yeah, most so of for, for, you for might not. it's not it's gonna it it could be it, it, when I when I when I was in the car driving it, initially there was that sense of outrage. This is just too much money. But then I had this moment where I thought to myself, these cars are probably underpriced. Everyone wants them, they can sell two of them yeah. when they make. So if you had the kit on, are you actually just taking the car to the value it should be at? What do you reckon? Edward, well, you've got strong views on this. Uh, Porsche price things. Pro pro probably, although most people w would worry about putting 80 grand's worth of kit on it if they're not going to get the cash back. Um, mm. how however, I think, you know, we, we see that, you know, the, the guys that turn up at the track days week in, week out, they're in 991 and 992 GT3. So, you know, what a great car to own for five years, six years, put the kit on, have a have an absolute weapon at the circuit, as you and I said earlier on. You know there is a big problem with the uh, the new GT3 RS that there's no front um, compartment, there's no storage, and yeah. actually you can get the storage with a 992 GT3 with the with the Manti kit. That you should be a journalist on what car, but that is very consumer based. Thank you very uh, much. I didn't um, know that. 
because of that's true there's no there's no they've they've moved the rads in board on the rs so there's, oh, no, okay. there's no frunk anymore uh right last week uh we discussed some music choices or we suggested some music choices and, and and what spawned from that because of the great rohan who basically runs the collecting cars office uh is a spotify playlist if you go if you type in collecting cars onto spotify driving tunes collecting addicts but it is on on the collecting driving cars. tunes collecting addicts that's a snappy title not uh and Rohan did that by the way we're going we are going to add just <laughs> add one tune each we'll get through it quickly we're not going to start weeping emotionally you can have a few mm. words Manish, you can't go on too long about this one. Much as we it's already it. got more, it's already got more than one tune each in it. So we'll have to refine it. We'll discuss it during the week. So we're going to we're gonna add these tunes. I'm going to start off. I'd like you in the next week to listen to ZZ Top's classic "Cheap Sunglasses." It's a wonderful, wonderful tune to listen to in the car, preferably an old car with a bit of air coming through it. Move on, Manish Pandey. What are you going to have? Paul Marriott, Love is Blue, 1973. It's just evocative of things like Bless This House, Carry On, whatever. It's just perfect. Kitsch, English, lovely. Okay. Uh, Neil? My best driving music thing is driving the Mulholland Drive in LA from the Hollywood Bowl down to the PCH. Start off at dark at one end and you get to sunrise the other end. And that's got to be with Tom Petty, Free Falling, just the top track. You actually drive along Ventura Boulevard, which <laughs> is actually in the song. Deeply brilliant. And God bless him, Tom Petty. Uh, Chris Cooper. It's 14 minutes and 18 seconds of Telegraph Road, Dire Straits. Oh. Oh. I got mocked last week by lots of people for meatloaf and... <laughs> Out so out so all of last week. week's suggestions are there, so you can go and yeah, you'll, yeah. Get, you'll get you'll get mocked again. You'll get mocked again because you're a, you're a white man of a certain age listening to Dire Straits. But Dire Straits are great, so why can't you listen to Dire Straits? So Telegraph Road. It's, it's just the best. Oh, it's brilliant. Great tune, um, Edward. What are you going to go for? Something probably remarkably weird. I would have thought. Well, it is weird. Well, I'm younger than all of you, and and uh, to be honest, with you, I have three young children. I live in central London. My journey home is about three and a half minutes. I have very little chance nowadays, and and I delved in over the last uh, forty eight hours or so into my Spotify account, and it did bring back wonderful memories of when I used to be able to drive. And I've got an eclectic mix, I, and I'm terrible with my memory of, of music. So I put a couple on our chat earlier on, which are ones that I particularly like. But actually, Daft Punk is music I enjoy in a car. Mm. And rather than giving you some some of their bigger hits, there's there's two particular tracks I like. One of them is Face to Face, and the other one is um, Give Life Back to Music, which are quite modern iterations of their music. But I like Daft Punk. I love it in a car and I love it when it's dark outside. Did well, you know that they auctioned a Ferrari a black? They either auctioned it or gave away a black 412i, didn't they? It was, a, it, was a, it was either a 400 or a 412, I can't remember. But, oh, but nice. it, it was definitely that shape. And they had the, they had them with the helmets outside, didn't they? That's it right. Back, and it was black and it was beautiful. 400, but, I think. I can't believe they're not coming back. When, when they just quietly announced they'd gone, it was, I, I, I remember tweeting randomly after eight years, when's the new album coming out? There's not, not a chance. <laughs> uh, right, thank you very much for some more stinky, nerdy car chat. My learned colleagues... Chris Cooper, Manish Pandey, Neil Clifford, and Ed would love it. Please get in the comments section, have a chat about what we're up to, do what you want, suggest songs, suggest things we should talk about. We'll run out of ideas at some point because we're old and we've got yeah. adult brains. Um, uh, thank you very much, and we'll speak to you. We, we'd like you to make your way to collectingcars.com under articles, which we have now have comments in there. So it's a great place to leave us some um, topics of conversation to talk about. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. See you later.